welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 Radio Program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program today, we thought we would have a little fun and go back in time to about the 1950s, 1960s in Erland, S- Southern California. It was actually a time just before I enjoyed growing up in the same area that our guest today is joining us to talk about. Our guest today also moved on from being a child to moving on to an illustrious career in art as he also graduated from the Center of College of Design in 1979. He also did a degree in Fine Art and Art Center in 1988. His drawings and paintings have been exhibited in galleries and museums throughout the United States. I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program today our guest and author of the book Confessions of a Good Kid. Hey. Welcome to the program today, William. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, You can just call me Bill. William's a little pretentious, I think. (laughs) Especially when you're coming from the Long Beach area. Nobody ever says William. (laughs) Absolutely. And I have to admit, you uh, gave me a pretty good build up there, so I'm going to try to live up to it. Oh, thank you very much. You know, it's actually a lot of fun when uh, the producer talked about this book. I was like, wow, this is kind of interesting how this kind of timed because... I was just in the Long Beach area. I was actually taking my wife to California. I was born in Torrance, grew up mostly in the San Pedro, Wilmington area, but spent quite a bit of time in Long Beach as well. And we just, uh, I went back there for the first time in about 40 years. (laughs) And it was pretty exciting. And I know one of the things you talk about in your book that I wanted, that I talked to her quite a bit about, was a place known as the Pike. And people always look at me, well, what's the Pike? And I also knew it as Queens Park, and so I would share with them, well, think about Coney Island and New York City scaled down just a bit and on the beach at the same time, and that's what you get with the Pike. But apparently, as I kept talking to people over the years about it, when somebody would pop up from the area, they would say, well, I don't think that's there anymore. So (laughs) things have changed, haven't they? Oh, yeah, significantly. Although um, the Pike has a legacy in Long Beach that's pretty strong because that area, which is totally renovated, it's got a movie theater and stores and all that stuff, it's still called the Pike. Um, So they're evidently trying to, you know, hold on to some of the history. But, no, the amusement park is completely gone. There was one concession called loops which was this weird game where um, I don't even know if I can describe it Uh, you throw like a ball or something and it goes into some kind of little container and you somehow win prizes with like a was you know invented in 1920 but um, that was the last element of the amusement park And uh, in order for the city to get a hold of the property, they persuaded this guy to allow the city to move his little concession stand somewhere in the middle of the city. So that odd little game is still functioning somewhere in the middle of Long Beach. Wow, that's amazing. Hmm. I know uh, as I was there, what I noticed too is I knew when I was there, because we came in at night, and I came around the corner, and I seen this large Ferris wheel, and I said, this has to be where the Pike used to be. It was a big neon Ferris wheel, and sure enough, as we rounded the corner, it said the Pike. <laughs> I said, okay, yeah, here yeah, you go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I was really sorry to see it go, because when I was a kid, I loved that place. Um, it was totally sleazy, but it was kind of like the antithesis of Disneyland, which was new at the time. So... Um, if we were lucky, we could persuade some parents to take us to Disneyland where everything was clean and fresh and, and new and they had Adventureland and Tomorrowland and Fantasyland and I think Frontierland. Um, and that was great. You know, we loved it. But then if, uh, you know, things went in a different direction, somebody would actually take us down to the Pike, which was um, – decadent, there were tattoo parlors, there were sailors vomiting, you know, it was uh, a real mess, but kind of a glorious mess, and for some reason that appealed to me a little more than Disneyland. Well, sure, you know, I think it got more of our sensible curiosity, you know, being from Southern California, and about the time that you write about, uh, as being a child, we're talking about like grade school, moving into junior high and high school. 
And uh, we were quite adventurous then, you know, growing up in those areas in those times. And uh, it was funny because as, for instance, my wife was talking to me about this, I I love the beauty of technology today because finally it it had dawned on me, literally, uh, I think it was, I want to say right around December of this last year, why don't I show you if they have it, what the pike looked like? Boom, you go to YouTube, and sure enough, there it was. And I said, this is what the pike used to be. You know, so then that way she could put what I was describing the whole time into perspective. But even furthermore, the kinds of things that we used to do during that time as children. Now, I was born in 1964. Well, there I go. I'm directly aging myself. <laughs> hey, the, don't feel bad. I'm 10 years older. <laughs> you know, but the fact was is that uh, we also lived in a time in suburban America, especially in those areas. I mean, Long Beach was still quite a place, you know, uh, as far as the city is concerned, large buildings, so forth, San Pedro, Wilmington, lots of homes, lots of activity going on. But for the most part, I had parents that both worked outside the house, so I got to and from school on my own. Uh, yeah. After school, you had to find ways to entertain yourself uh, while the parents were gone, and we could care less whether they actually showed up except to make sure that we got dinner. <laughs> yeah. So it was a yeah. different time. Talk about what you think is the contrast between then with sort of, I guess, us growing up and kids today with technology sitting around, you know, and, and so forth. Well, um, I think, and this relates directly to what you just said, um, preeminently it was the fact that we had this autonomy. Um, I walked up to the bus stop from our house, which was, you know, four or five blocks when I was five years old to go to kindergarten, Um, but that wasn't unique. Every other kid in the neighborhood was doing the same thing, and we were out running around, um, and at that particular time, so we actually moved to Long Beach in uh, 1956 when I was three, and we moved into a relatively new upper middle class uh, tract, and there were a lot of vacant lots. So we had plenty of places to play, and some of them were so overgrown that we referred to them as jungles because you could go in there and, you know, from the street, you couldn't see what was going on because there were so many trees and so many bushes. So we actually had this kind of, you know, hidden little kind of adventure zone um, and nobody was paying any attention. So, you know, we did some naughty stuff, but nobody got seriously hurt. And the parents uh, were pretty comfortable with it. There were parents, you know, in every house so that if somebody did get hurt, you could essentially just knock on any door and be assured that you would get some help. And there were tons of kids, too. Almost every um, house um, had a complete little nuclear family with one to four kids. Um, But I think it's the autonomy, you know, just as you say. And uh, I I know uh, one of the places that you uh, got a kick out of hanging out is when they were building, I guess, an extension at Long Beach University or Long Beach College. (laughs) Yeah. Well, so the college was new, too. And um, as I was growing up, I guess you could say the college was growing up relative to buildings being built, dormitories, things like that. So it was a great place to go and just engage in some mild vandalism for a few hours um, on those sites where people were working. And uh, again, I don't know if this is exclusive to me and a couple of my friends or if it's relatively universal, but for some reason the sound of breaking glass was absolutely intoxicating to us. So we would go into these areas, you know, where they were building and the workers would have left, you know, soda bottles and probably beer bottles. we just collect those, and then we just start throwing them um, against the concrete walls and stuff for no good reason. You know, if you analyze why a kid is doing something, you're not going to come up with any kind of intelligent answer. Um, but, yeah, we could spend hours doing stuff like that, and I'm sure, you know, the next Monday those – 
workers were not very happy about having to clean that stuff up. Um, but yeah, it was great. I mean, wonderful stuff, absolutely. Well, I agree that there actually must be a universal appeal because one thing we really loved being on the hunt for, uh, especially if you can find areas that had either uh, stores or industrial-style buildings, would be the fluorescent tubes that would go into the lighting, you know, like the big long, and the way those things would break, how you could drop them, you know, end to end down, and they just kind of crumble in one spot into powdered dust and the sound those things would make. Yeah. And, and it's funny because that story that you uh, had talked about in your book when, uh, about the glass was funny because I was reminiscent of one of the parks we went by uh, in Wilmington that we used to go to, or at least I used to go to quite a bit, was Banning Park. And uh, oh, okay. now back then, and this is the 1970s, uh, Banning Park looks the same, but one change that it made is it built this big iron fence around the, I guess, barracks or headquarters that's there in the middle of the park. So you can't get into it, I guess, unless there's a certain time that you tour. But before then, you could get to it at any time. But they had these, and they still have those uh, lights throughout the park today where the uh, shades that go over the top of the lamppost kind of, I would say, resemble what looks like an ice cream, you know, poured out of a machine. And one of them happened to have a hole in it at the time, and this is, well, I guess I was about fourth or fifth grade. So I don't know what kind of stupid thinking as a kid I had. My brothers were with me, but I grabbed a rock literally, not to break it, but to see if I could throw it through the hole <laughs> of those lampshade. The next thing you know, it didn't work so well because you hear the shatter and this thing drops to the ground and over at that barrack or headquarter place, I hear somebody shout, hey, you, <laughs> like that. And yeah. I flew like the wind and I went running around the corner for whatever dumb reason. I thought, running behind the McDonald's that was right behind uh, or right there by the park on Pacific Coast Highway that I could be hidden and nobody would find me. Of course, I got caught. But we ended up becoming yeah. really good friends with, I guess, the park guy who took me home to talk to my mother about it. I was let off the hook. And, <laughs> you know, there you go. In fact, every day it seemed after school I'd show up to say hi to him. He'd give me a quarter, so I'd go to the McDonald's where I tried to run away from him and, there you go. <laughs> so it was pretty crazy back in those days. Well, but see, that's a great story, and, and I have similar stories, and my friends do, that involve a situation like that where I pulled some dumbass stunt and got caught, um, and there was an element of punishment, you know, attached to that. But usually the people who caught me were – you know, kind of forgiving, remembering the stuff they had done, and ultimately you would form sort of a bond and a mutual respect. And, um, you know, I think that was kind of a a good model because, uh, A, you know, you realize that you did something stupid and you are sorry for it because ultimately you find that you like the person who suffered you know, due to your malfeasance. And I think that's kind of a better way of learning maybe not to do so many stupid things than just I'm going to thrash you or call on the police. Um, But, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. You know, and it kind of makes you wonder if this day and age, if we had pulled this kind of thing, what would actually happen? I don't know. I mean, I I teach college-level classes, and I have students who are, you know, 17, 18, 19, 20. So obviously they're not the same age we were when we were doing this stuff. But what I hear from them is that they really don't have any opportunity to find out because their their lives and their time are, you know, so sort of orchestrated that they're never out there on their own. And so they're not making any decisions, whether they're intelligent or stupid, you know, the decisions are being made for them. You know, and also, it, it, it gets kind of crazy that way because uh, we didn't really have that kind of technology as they do today. In fact, I was uh, by a pizza parlor that we used to go to there uh, just right up the street uh, 
I think it's called Red West now. It used to be called Red Vest. And back then, that oh, was yeah. when, Oh, oh you're familiar with what I'm talking about. Very good. In yeah, fact, I when I showed up that day to talk to my wife, we bought a pizza there. The inside looks exactly the same as it did when we left in 1976. <laughs> You know, a little yeah. bit of changes, but for the most part, it looks the same. And the owner who actually bought it two years after we left happened to be there. So I was really jazzed to be able to talk to him about that. And I said, you know, there was this is where I discovered, or we first discovered the first video ping pong game. Right. And he right. said, now this was really fascinating, that up through about 1984, 85, he actually had that machine in still. And there would sometimes be a line of kids waiting to play this thing. This is 1985 when you had Nintendo, for crying out loud. Well, you know, some of those things don't lose their appeal. I, I know that now that original Pong game is obviously considered a classic. It's probably an antique. But there are people, even young people, who like playing it for whatever reason. Now, one thing, especially being boys, uh, that you talked about that I found kind of funny because I was also remembering a friend of mine, and this was about in third grade, give or take. Uh, he would always say he was a, a Mexican friend of mine, and I think his name was Ray, if I go back and try to remember correctly. And it was funny because he would talk about some, something that he found over by a garbage and this and that and the other, and there was this magazine, and he'd always say, and it was a Playboy, too. <laughs> and the way he said that, then I'm like, what? what was, you know, and that smile, and the way he's a, a play, and it was always a Playboy, too, you know. And, of course, you eventually find out what a Playboy magazine is. But you seem oh, yeah. to have a kind of a similar story, especially when it comes to striking gold. Well, I really did strike gold. I, and my situation, I think, was a bit unusual because um, – my parents and especially my dad were pretty liberal about those things. And this was, you know, probably the early 60s now when I was that same age you described, around third grade. Um, but he would buy Playboy and Esquire and True and all those things. Um, but he wouldn't attempt to hide it. It would just be lying out there on the family room table with all the other magazines. And, and there were a lot of magazines. My mom bought all the fashion stuff and everything. So, you know, just being a kid with idle curiosity, I'd pick these things up randomly once in a while. And uh, the first time I picked that one up, I really got an eyeful. Um, and it seemed, although nobody had said anything, uh, that probably it was something I shouldn't be looking at. Um, the idea of an adult naked woman, yeah, it had certain implications. Um, but I would sneak around and look at those, and then finally one day probably, I think I was around fourth or fifth grade, somehow I ended up talking to my dad about it, and I asked him if it was okay if I could look at it, because none of my friends did. When I told them, you know, I was looking at Playboy, you know, their jaws dropped and their eyes bugged out. Um, and they wanted to come over, you know, so they could do it. Um, but my dad actually said, okay, he said, do you think you're old enough? And I thought about it for a moment and said, yeah. And he said, well, okay, I don't suppose it's going to do you any harm. And uh, from then on, I was the kid whose father let him read Playboy. Now imagine today what would happen. <laughs> Nothing, because they're all looking at stuff on the Internet. Right. You know? But yeah. I mean the idea of someone finding out that your dad might have somehow allowed this, whether well, they even know what the fact is or not, what would happen? Probably they'd call, you know, uh, child services yeah, exactly. and foster care. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's more craziness. I mean – you know, I understand the impulse to try to protect children. It's a laudable impulse. I'm sure we all feel that way. But um, some of this stuff, and I'm sure you hear this all the time, as everybody does, just seems to have gone so far that it's, it's gotten ludicrous. And innocent parents are being lumped in with people that are, you know, obviously pedophiles and violent um, 
but there doesn't seem to be a willingness to examine each case on its own merits, you know? Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, this day and age, it seems everybody has an opinion that seems to become fact, and, and there are a lot of people that actually get hung out to dry at things that I think unnecessarily, and it's funny when you talk about your father feeling, well, you know, if you think you're old enough to see this, then I don't see how it's going to hurt. And it was in the 1970s that in Long Beach that I first remember streaking. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, let's talk about that one, because I'm pretty sure isn't that where it started for the most part? That I couldn't tell you. I remember the phenomenon. It seemed to just happen suddenly. Um, and it seemed to involve somebody you know, doing a, a streak through a football game. I remember a guy did it during the Academy Awards, and David Niven, who was presenting an award at that moment, made a pretty amusing comment about him, you know, being remembered for his shortcomings. Um, but you might be right. I, I really don't know. Um, well and the reason I say that is because this is my memory of it was being on the main strip in Long Beach, California, and people walking around holding up handmade signs with not anything else. <laughs> really? Really? So yes. when you say the main drag, are you referring to like Long Beach Boulevard or Second Street? It or could be, yes. Yeah. See, it's been such a long time, I don't even really remember the areas there. Oh. I just remember as you would come in up over the bridge and go into downtown, oh, yeah. that's where you would see these people. So. Yeah. Well, the time would have been right mm -hmm. for that because it was sort of post-hippie and a lot of more or less you know, middle Americans were starting to embrace some of the tenets of the hippie culture. They were feeling a little freer, you know, a little more able to express themselves. And they kind of saw the humor in it, um, which I think is healthy. Um, for me, the only real streak I did was when a friend of mine and I, we rode bicycles uh, across the country. And uh, this was around 1974, <clears throat> 73. Um, so we, went, we ended up at uh, the Petrified Forest in Arizona. Uh, and for some reason, I just felt it incumbent upon myself to streak the Petrified Forest. Um, <laughs> I guess that would be as safe a place as any. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the other thing that I, I did get a kick out of when I was, I think, a senior in high school was uh, driving nude because I just got my driver's license a year or two before, and there was something about being out there late at night, driving around with no clothes on. And it's another idiotic thing. I mean, you, you describe it just in talking about it. I'm thinking, God, do I want people to know I did this? But yeah, it was fun. And, and then if I could persuade you know, a girl to join me, it was even more fun. Um, and I never got caught, thank God. Yeah, nowadays it's pretty much about the uh, most erratic t tweet that you could actually put out there or post on Facebook. It's like, there ain't nothing risque or dangerous about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Crazy Although stuff. a friend of mine did um, moon a cop. He hung his bare ass out the window. He and his buddies would drive around at night doing that, you know, to other motorists. And... Uh, he had the misfortune to do it to an undercover cop and got arrested for it. Um, so that was actually pretty funny. Mm. Let's talk about uh, Leslie. I'm sorry about Leslie. Oh, Leslie. Okay. Um, well, I've got uh, quite a bit to say about that. I mean, most of it's, you know, written down in that book, but, um, yeah, she was my first real girlfriend, and uh, I was 15, and so was she. And I think, again, everybody has, you know, probably a similar experience where all of a sudden you sort of understand what love is, and you're also, if you're lucky, exploring what sex is. And uh, she was terrific. I mean, she had a great sense of humor. She was cute. She was smart you know, everything I was looking for, certainly. And she was also enthusiastic about exploring all of these things as much as I was. So um, 
we had a pretty good thing going. And, uh, and feel free to stop me, you know, if I've talked too long about this or if I'm taking it too far. Um, but I assume since you mentioned her name that you're referring to our little debacle of getting caught almost in flagrante delecto. Is that right? Well, what I was uh, remembering especially was uh, how you came to know each other, and then you had the nukes and crannies in the school areas, things like that, oh, yeah, lots of places yeah, yeah. You, you could go and enjoy each other's company, so to speak. Yeah, well, yeah, so the high school was right across from a big park called Recreation Park. Um, so my schedule was I'd have school, you know, all those classes till about 2, and then I was on the swim and water polo team, so I'd have a workout after that. But often we'd have a, about an hour, maybe an hour and a half between the end of school and the beginning of workout. So um, Leslie and I would meet at the park, and we pretty much reconnoitered the whole park. So we had found you know, places we could hide pretty effectively and uh, partially disrobe. Um, although we did get caught a couple of times by groundskeepers who uh, I think really enjoyed catching us and catching a glimpse of something they shouldn't have. Um, and then the school also was an older school, Wilson High School. Um, yeah, and it did have these odd little rooms in different places. So if you had the wherewithal, you could sort of explore and find uh, rooms for storage and just places that were dusty and unused. And uh, in one case, we had gotten up on top of one of the buildings where there was a sun deck and found a closet full of these folding lounges, these wooden folding lounges with canvas, and they were old. And so, you know, again, being young and dumb, we pulled one of those out and set it up uh, on the deck, figuring we'd have engaged in a nice hot makeout session. And we got started, and it was looking good. And I was in the cot, and she was on top of me. And then all of a sudden, the whole thing collapsed. And uh, I ended up with the entire um, lounge attached to one of my fingers. And it was crushed in there. And uh, Leslie didn't know what to do. I mean, she thought it was ridiculously funny, but also I was obviously in pain, and we had to get the thing off. Um, and eventually we did, and we retreated. And the legacy of that was a nice black fingernail that showed up in uh, one of the photos that was taken for uh, a formal dance. Um, so, yeah, you know, some fun, some tears, but all good. Absolutely. You know, it's a lot of fun for people I know when they pick up this book, Confessions of a Good Kid, talking about what it was like to grow up in a different time and era when we were adventurous. And a lot of that also translates into our adult years, doesn't it? Well, I think it does. Um, you know, we lived it, so in a way it's hard to be objective, but... Um, I think, and of course, I'm 10 years older than you, so, you know, just culturally, there may be some substantial differences there. I don't know. You could certainly speak to that. But the people that I grew up with generally um, lived through a time when there was this profound shift from the conservatism of the Eisenhower years to the liberality of, you know, the psychedelic and hippie years. So by the time we finished high school, most of us couldn't wait to leave home and to have what we considered adventures. So I had friends who immediately lit out for Australia. Another guy I knew took off for Africa. Um, I went to South America, to Bogota, Medellin, in Colombia to teach English. Um, and then, you know, we like I said, rode bikes across the country and I think made decisions about our careers and our future based more upon what we thought would be exciting and fun rather than what would be safe. Um, so I, I think you make a very good point there. Um, certainly the students that I work with are 
very concerned about things. I don't get a sense of adventure from them. I get a sense of anxiety about what's going to happen and how they can take steps to make sure they find a safe place for themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, there's no doubt about, you know, we always talk about how things change and they do inevitably, but, you know, the question becomes rather than playing it safe, what do you do that's, you know, enjoyable, fun, creative, as well as maybe even life-changing? Yeah, well, and here you are. I mean, you're doing a radio program, which is something that obviously most people don't do, and you're obviously having a good time and success at it. Um, And I think maybe everybody doesn't get to do that. But on the other hand, if you don't give it a shot, you're never going to have a chance at it. So um, maybe the triumph is in just allowing yourself the opportunity to take the risk, and at least you'll know you gave it a shot rather than uh, maybe, you know, looking at things towards the end of your life and going, man, if I had only done this or I would only done that, things could have been so different. You know, at least you tried it and you know. Absolutely. Well, I want to thank you for taking the time to be on the program today. Again, the book is Confessions of a Good Kid. Tell our listeners how they can find out how to go about getting the book, if there's a website, things like that. Well, thank you. Um, There is a website. It's called confessionsgk.com. But really all you have to do is just go to Amazon and uh, just do a search on Confessions of a Good Kid. It will come up. All the information is there. The reviews are there. It's available in an e-book edition. Um, And, you know, this is not really about money. I'm just hoping that a few people will read it, enjoy it, and have a good time with it. And uh, if you're one of those people, I would really appreciate a review. Absolutely. Um, (laughs) I promised that I would not do a lot of heavy marketing for my book because I know you need to keep your listeners interested and entertained. So thank you for that plug. And uh, I'd also like to thank Joy for being so helpful to me. Well, absolutely, Bill. Thank you so much for being on the program today. It's been fun. It has. Have a good one. You too. I want to thank you, the listeners out there, for joining us. You can discover more at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. We do encourage you to sign up for our weekly e-newsletter. Keep up to date with what's going on in the world of Beyond 50 as well as our upcoming shows. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for joining us. This is the Beyond 50 Radio Program. And remember, live your day past halfway. <laughs> <laughs>